A reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. The year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes a young plant come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, beginning at the 16th verse. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Taste everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise be God. Proclaimed in the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1, and reading from the 6th verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John. And the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Well, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John 
was baptized. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Mighty God, as we come before you now, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may open our hearts and minds that we may be transformed into the light that we may be transformed into the messengers sent from God to announce the light in the world. Amen. Please be seated. said that today is what is commonly known as Rejoice Sunday. You might have picked up that word from the reading in Isaiah about being joyful. You might have picked it up when you listened to Tristan, Tristan read the, I was about to say Charlene, <laughs> uh, when, when he read from the letter to the Thessalonians. The thing about rejoice is if we watch the news, and if we um, consider what's going on in the world around us, there's possibly not very much to rejoice about. It's a dark place, particularly since we live in South Africa, we have Eskom. But that's the funny side of it. But there are awful things happening in the world. And when we consider that from time to time we have to experience load shedding, that's not such a big deal. So I want to talk a little bit about something else. It's the nature of salvation and of mission. So the story goes of <laughs> of a Sunday, I must keep talking so we can adjust the sound properly. Um, of the um, <laughs> of a Sunday school teacher, <laughs> not one of ours, but this Sunday school re uh, teacher reports a conversation she had with our Sunday school, with, not ours, a Sunday school class. So she poses them a question. She says, if I sold my house, my car, had a massive garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. From, you know the song? The children all answered, no. Okay, so she tried another question. If I clean the church every day, and maybe if I clean my room every day, or maybe when I get a little bit older, I mowed the lawn every day, and kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? So the children answer, no. She's thinking, yes, we've taught these children properly about grace. So she tries again. Well then, if I ask, if I, if, I, if I were kind to animals and gave sweets to all the children and loved my neighbor, would that get me into heaven? And the children answered, No! no. Well then, how can I get into heaven? There was one five-year-old boy, again, out of mouths of babes and sucklings. You gotta be dead. <laughs> and that's just it. You gotta be dead. No, I don't think so. The Advent lessons that we heard read today from Isaiah, from the letter to the Thessalonians, one of the letters to the Thessalonians, and then John, lead us to think about such things as salvation and mission. 
and we may as well admit it, we tend to think in terms of such questions as from what are we being saved? Are we being saved from God's punishment? Are we being saved from the devil? Are we being saved from our own sins? Maybe even, are we being saved from death? And all these questions tend to make us think of salvation in terms of getting into heaven. Thinking like this, of course, inevitably leads us to see mission as the work of getting as many people into heaven as you possibly can. Furthermore, this kind of thinking makes us ask questions like, okay, so who will be saved? Or who will be in heaven? We must be careful here because we venture into this very gray area of predestination. Or we move into this very gray area of really good people that might actually, in fact, we'll be surprised who's in heaven. My mind. And underneath it all is that little boy's assumption that the single prerequisite for salvation and heaven is death. No. Along come Isaiah and John. Isaiah is a prophet, is a poet. If you go and look at the way it's written in your texts, those of you who like to follow, you'll see it's written in a poetic form. John, in today's reading from the Gospel of John, is a man sent from God who came as a witness. Both Isaiah and John have something to say about salvation. What they both seem to be saying is that salvation is not about another place or another time. Both Isaiah and John, if you read carefully, announce that salvation is the reality of this world as it should be, as God intended it. Isaiah offers a vision of just what salvation looks like. We are to turn our attention to those named as recipients of God's good news. And dear friends, since earlier this year when we read that passage about Lazarus and Dives, you know the guy that went to hell because he didn't help Lazarus, Lazarus went to heaven, it was a whole warning, you remember that? Since then, I have been seriously challenged. Father, just pass that. We are called to turn our attention to the poor, the oppressed, the broken-hearted, captives, prisoners, the mournful, the faint of spirit. And our colleague captures that very nicely. I was, I, I looked at it. Um, Jan brought it to me for proofreading, and I thought, no, this is a bit heavy. And I sort of went searching for another colleague. And I, because I'd been challenged so much, I actually went with this colleague to the end. And look at it. It says, to the free, uh, you call us home from exile of selfish oppression to the freedom of justice, the balm of healing, the joy of sharing. Make us strong to join you in your holy work as friends of strangers and victims, companions of the outcast, and the consolation of the brokenhearted. That is what we're called to. Our mission to, with, and among people such as these defines God's people as those people who exist for the sake of the other. <coughs> Furthermore, Isaiah, the poet, the prophet, says we will know we are involved in God's mission, saving mission work when others, the nations of the world, notice that God's people somehow, some way, live differently. That is, we live for God. We live for others. 
all others. We don't just come to church to get our spiritual pickup. No, we come to be transformed. And if you go to an earlier chapter in the prophet in the book of the prophet Isaiah, 49 verse 6, that same prophet says, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And so, on the stage of salvation history, enter the light. The light that was from before time and who continues forever. In the first chapter of the Gospel according to John, one of the most magnificent pieces of writing in our sacred texts, and that's John the Evangelist, not John the Baptist, we mustn't get confused, one is immediately struck by the fact that John, the Baptist, is not named John the Baptizer as he is in Mark, or John the Baptist as he is named in Matthew, or even John the son of Zechariah as we find in Luke's Gospel. John is simply a man sent from God as a witness to testify to the light. Now, of course, we know that whole first passage that many of you could probably quote it verbatim, but the light is the word, the logos, which has been with God and is God since before creation. And as it says in the first chapter of John, through him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. This same word, or light, we are told, became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally translated, he pitched his tent to tent among us. Who likes camping? I do. I like camping. Imagine that. The light of creation comes and pitches his tent next to yours. He might have a Land Rover or a Jeep. I know Jeeps aren't those so fantastic. With a rooftop tent, camping with you, cooking with you, doing stuff with you. The thing about this other camper, who doesn't have a generator, because generators are irritating in campsites, is God's Word. As God's Word, God's light grew up and lived in our midst, He would one day read Isaiah chapter 61, we hear about that in Luke chapter 14, in his own hometown synagogue and declare, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That is, the time is now to begin living out the vision of salvation and mission Isaiah had proclaimed centuries before. Today. It is time for salvation as the reality of this world as it should be, as God intended. It is this vision of salvation and mission John, that John was sent to witness to. John is a witness. In the Greek, he is martyria, from which we get the word martyr. And he witnesses to the light. Witnesses say that they have seen or heard or even attest to the truth of another's testimony. I get a little bit confused because John grew up with Jesus and how come didn't he actually recognize him? Remember a little later on when he's in prison he sends his disciples off to Jesus and says are you the one to come and must we wait for another? Belief in the sense of recognizing the true light that has come into the world. A light that the darkness cannot and will not overcome. And a call to the attention of this light so that others might recognize and believe. Belief in that sense means to recognize, to trust and commit ourselves to the light. The light which is a fulfillment 
of Isaiah's prophecy so many years before. This in turn means, to, means that we are to commit ourselves to the kind of salvation and mission that we hear from Isaiah, that John recognizes, that Jesus lives, and that both John and Jesus call us to follow so that our lives might be a light to the nations. I'm just a bit worried about talking about the light of the nations or we're running down to the church in question. Dear friends, John was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. John did not come to decorate everyone and everything like some great big Christmas tree. John did not come to announce the beginning of the Christmas sale season. He did not come to stir us into a frenzy of shopping and spending. He came to remind us and to bear witness to all who will listen that the darkest forces of this world are not as powerful as they claim to be. They're not nearly as powerful as they appear to be. We begin this third Sunday of Advent in a way with the collect that we would have prayed in the 19th century, I brought it, the Sunday next before Advent, we now use it as um, Christ the King and we've lost this collect. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, I did say to someone that um, three weeks ago you should have been mixing up your Christmas pudding. Stir up Sunday. We are called to stir up God's power with the great might that comes among us. Dear friends, will we take the time for the rest of this Advent, not much time left, only a week and a bit, to allow God to stir things up within us and within our parish and throughout the church so that we might become more like John, a man sent from God. Because, for that, because that is in fact who we really are, men and women, sent from God as witnesses to testify to the light, so that all might believe through Him. Maybe, just maybe, as we testify, as we bear witness to and proclaim the glory of the light, we will embody the light and become those who reveal the life of Christ anew in the world, a world that increasingly is desperate so desperate to see and know the light that we know. As it says in John, the light is life, and the life was the light of all people. Dear friends, all people look to us to see the light. When all that we say and all that we do bears witness to the light, heaven and salvation will be understood not as a time and place after death, but rather the world as it should be in the here and now. Amen.